BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. All right, hello everybody. Today is Friday, another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. First, I would like to give a big thank you to everyone who listened to the latest episode in the Versus series talking about the Preppy Killer and the Affluenza Teen. The Versus series is a set of episodes that comes out on Thursdays where I talk about psychological breakdowns, doing a comparing and contrasting of famous people from the true crime world very frequently using serial killers, but for the first time I did one on two people who were not indeed serial killers, but just had received a lot of news coverage surrounding their true crime cases, and I did one on the preppy killer, Robert Chambers, and the affluenza teen, Ethan Couch, and that is available here on this channel, and there has been a whole playlist made for the Versus series. And before we begin today's episode, I would like to remind you guys that I am also the host of Astro Psych 400, a different channel here on YouTube. Some people were saying that they use this program, Black Box Online Radio, as a way to fall asleep at night, and I thought, why not create a program specifically customized to help people fall asleep? And you can get that on the channel, Astro Psych 400. And there are going to be some other videos on there about psychology, astrology, personality traits, lots of things to explore. And please like and subscribe to both channels. Why not? And another great way that you can help out both shows is to go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse by me, Ned DeHaan. It is a novel murder mystery inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to have a look at some of the merchandise and remember... Being weird is not a crime. And in this episode, I will talk to you guys all about Ingersoll Lockwood and a book that was written by Todd Wood and Walter Bosley. And in fact, why don't I just show you? And in today's episode, I'm going to be discussing this book here, The Mystery of Ingersoll Lockwood, which is written by Todd Wood and Walter Bosley here. But there's also another one out that called The Curious Case of Margarita Todd. I wanted to show you guys this because if you ever purchase any of the Todd Wood books, the Walter Bosley books, they are double covered. It's the first time I've had a set of books that is completely double covered and identical because I pulled them out of the envelope in the mail and I was like, oh, well, I guess it's like one of those things where it's written from right to left. No, they're just um, double covered books. Once again, The Mystery of Ingersoll Lockwood by Todd Wood and Walter Bosley. Of course, there's also The Curious Case of Margarita Todd. And this person here in the photo, I thought was Mark Twain, actually, because you can see Donald Trump, Napoleon. And I thought that was Mark Twain at first, but then I realized that was kind of silly because, of course, that's not Mark Twain. That's Ingersoll Lockwood, the man who is featured on the cover. Anyway, just wanted to share this with you guys, and now let's get to the full episode. And in addition to reading this book here, The Mystery of Ingersoll Lockwood, I would also like to give a big thank you to Todd Wood, whom I've had the opportunity to correspond with, talking not only about his books, but also about true crime cases, and we'll even see how there could be some type of connection to the 1960s and 70s, as well as all throughout the 20th century. And I also want to give the disclaimer that this is going to be an episode that is going to be going all up and down the spectrum, talking about all types of subjects and how they could be loosely connected and just how it's connected to life in general. Because one thing that I had to learn the hard way, I think it was back in 2017, just prior to starting this YouTube channel, actually, is that everything in life is interlocking and the people who are going to tell you that it's not are sorely mistaken. Either that, or they're just trying to manipulate and get out of uh, facing reality. But 
our events in life are connected to one another. But to talk about the mystery of Ingersoll Lockwood, first we need an introduction on who was he, and there's one that is provided here on page 10 of this book. Abraham Lincoln personally selected Ingersoll Lockwood to be consul to the Kingdom of Hanover throughout the duration of the U.S. Civil War. Lockwood was the youngest serving diplomat at the time. Ingersoll Lockwood would subsequently pursue a writing career and establish himself on the lecture circuit. Married in the 1880s, Lockwood would divorce his wife after only a short time. He retired to Saratoga Springs and died in 1918 at the age of 77. An inscription in Lockwood's final book perhaps reveals a hint of the sort of knowledge that Lockwood pursued. The end has almost come. I'm only waiting for the signal to push off and begin my voyage to the isles and the blessed in the far western seas. Now, as I said, going all across the spectrum, this is practically unrelated to the contents of the book, but I wanted to point out this thing about how he thinks that he's going to pass away and go to the western seas, or specifically the isles of the western seas. And you might be thinking about some things like um, the stories of Avalon, or perhaps just the trade winds and such. But why? Now, I have never read this anywhere. I have never encountered this from any other writer, researcher. It is my own original observation. If someone else has written something similar out there, I would request that you direct me to it so I could read their stuff. But I genuinely believe that there is something that happens to our brain, to our psychology, and the way that we're thinking about those who desire to travel to the West and those who desire to go to the East. Some people chase the rising moon and some people chase the falling sun, like people who move toward the sunset and people who move toward the moon rise. I think that there is something about our brains and the way that we are thinking. Maybe it's neurological programming. Maybe it is simply personality traits. And I get into a lot of this on Astro Psych 400. But for example, Thomas Jefferson was all about westward expansion. And he was very much a believer of that because geography is one reason. You have the Louisiana Purchase going on, and then they have all these other lands that are even beyond the Louisiana Purchase, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And from that point onward, I began to be curious about, well, why is it only about moving to the west? And there wasn't a whole lot of land to the east. That could be something. But I think that there is something that is much greater because in the early days of civilization, you know, when we got the river valleys like the Nile, the Indus, the Tigris, Euphrates, and the Huanghe River Valley, which has never fallen, actually, that went on to become the present day nation of China. Lots of people chose to move toward the west, to follow the sunset, to follow the falling sun. They're following the sun, period. The sun rises in the east and it moves to the west. Some people are following the sun and some people are following the moon. And the people who chose to migrate eastward, I think, have a very different um, psychological component. And even though I can't give you all of these specifics, I do think it affects our personality. I think it affects our ambitions. And if I do want to add a little more precision to the subject, I believe that people who move toward the West are going to be more analytical, more direct. They are going to be more observational, and they're going to try to solve things in more concrete ways, whereas people who move toward the East are going to try to be more introspective, more self-reflective, more thoughtful, just more thinking about ideas and internal peace and such, inner peace. And I think this is heavily exemplified by something that I read from Dr. Amit Goswami when he said that there's the story of the man from the East and the man from the West, and they want to learn the truth. And the man from the East asks the man from the West, how do you learn the truth? And the man from the West said, I open my eyes. And the man from the West then asked the man from the East, how do you learn the truth? And the man from the East said, I close my eyes. And instantly I understood what he was talking about. To, to the best of my knowledge, to the best of my abilities, I think that it isn't a complicated idea. The first one is that, again, it's about observations, it's about education, 
like like I open my eyes? Well, because they follow the sun so they can see what's going on in the world around them. And rationalism, discovery, exploration. And then the man from the east says that he closes his eyes because he follows the moon. And then it's all about thinking, meditation, self-reflection, evaluating, and achieving inner peace and such. And I was listening to Alan Watts do a lecture, and he was talking about the psychologist Carl Jung, and what he said in that one was that there is a very big division in the East versus West uh, terms of um, philosophy and meditation and such, whereas in the Western world, people use stories to get in touch with the unconscious. Okay, this is the story, and this is the meaning of the story, and this is the underlying structure, and these are the um, inspirational messages that come from the story, whereas in the Eastern world, it is more about being void. It's about removing um, desire. That's a big one. It's also about just removing any type of internal destruction and trying to be devoid of emotion. The contemporary definitions of emotion are just distractions. And he said that Westerners should be very difficult if they try to do that because Again, we have different neurological programming. We have different psychological components. That's just my take on the subject. And again, the book isn't really about this. But when I read this here, that these were his final words, that is something that really stood out to me. And now I, I, t I just told you some writers that have said some similar things to my own observation about those who follow the sun and those who follow the moon. But most of that is indeed my own original, just um, something that I'm curious about. If It's not a discovery or anything, because um, I can't really just show you that and hold it in my hand, but I do uh, think about it from time to time. Now, as you heard in the introduction that is in this book, though, it is going to be all about Ingersoll Lockwood and how he may have had a greater understanding of the future he was described as a writer, but if you were to Google Ingersoll Lockwood, you'll actually see that he is uh, also listed as a lawyer and definitely a diplomat, as you heard Abraham Lincoln's youngest serving diplomat. Now, the reason why he's mentioned in this book is because he wrote a series of short novels about the Trump name, specifically an individual named Baron Trump. And again, if you were to just put those into Google, you'll get a little tagline about how there's this boy named Baron Trump who gets frustrated living in Trump Castle. And I do confess that the illustrations provided of Baron Trump do heavily, heavily resemble not only Baron Trump, but also Donald Trump. And some of Ingersoll Lockwood's titles are Baron Trump in the Marvelous Underground Journey and 1900 or the Last President, which actually came out in 1896, talking about the election of 1896. And there's some questions that are asked to us, the readers, in this book. And it says, did Lockwood or his illustrator have some type of secret knowledge? Or let's hear a little more about the illustrator who created the strikingly similar depiction of Baron Trump. His name is Charles Howard Johnson, and there's something that is written about him on page 30. Charles Howard Johnson's illustration of Baron Trump in the late 19th century book by Lockwood looks startlingly, startlingly like Baron Trump at the time of his father's election in the 21st century. Johnson illustrated the character over a hundred years before the birth of the president's son. Could this be more than a coincidence, or did Johnson see the future? And I think that the... Um, there are three questions that are explored in this book, and it's about what is the meaning of all this? Number one, is it a coincidence? Number two, did somebody actually have the ability to see the future? And number three, is there a secret group of individuals who are passing on secret knowledge and that all of the worldly events are orchestrated and manipulated behind the scenes? And... Firstly, I'm very skeptical, so I definitely lean toward the first that there appears to be some type of coincidence, but I am also very much aware of how the internet climate, if you will, used to operate about 10, 15 years ago, because 
I mean, I, like many people, like many of you guys, have been with YouTube from the beginning, so we have the ability to follow these trends, and do you remember all that stuff they were saying about Barack Obama and Dick Cheney and the Illuminati, and about how there is this type of secret bloodline? It is something that has been widely discussed, and not only is there a secret bloodline, but there is one that is, um... Only certain people in this aristocratic and oligarchical bloodline have access to power. It's an aristocracy and an oligarchy. Aristocracy done by bloodline, oligarchy done by just the select chosen few. And this happened a lot when Barack Obama was running for office because they... I believe it was uh, Dick Cheney's own wife, Lynn Cheney, who um, in her own research pointed out that Dick Cheney and Barack Obama were ninth cousins, and the internet went wild with that, saying, oh, they're part of the same uh, bloodline or the same uh, same sort of um, aristocratic uh, connection, so to speak. And this one has been widely discussed, and it's been even more widely discussed since um, even before 2008, but going all the way back to Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code, as well as um, the movie that was popularized by uh, Tom Hanks. And um, I've been watching a lot of young Sheldon lately, so fun fact is what he likes to say. Fun fact, Ron Howard directed the movie The Da Vinci Code, and he was nominated for a Golden Raspberry Award for the worst director of the year. A lot of people didn't take too well to that, but they did praise Tom Hanks' performance. And the uh, Da Vinci Code talks about, again, something very similar, that there is a sacred bloodline that is... Um, been passed on from generation to generation, and some people are protectors of the bloodline. But how does that relate to future events? There are a lot of people in the world who believe that there is secret knowledge, that we don't actually have freedom, it's all an illusion for the absolute control of humanity to exist. The illusion of freedom has to be maintained. And to... um to keep going with that type of thinking, all of our decisions in elections or the political world or who gets to be president, all of this is predetermined and there's just the illusion of freedom. Perhaps you've, um, you're familiar with something like professional wrestling where it's all scripted, it's all determined. Some things might happen in the course of the events that are not extremely planned or there isn't foresight for everything, but the outcome has been predetermined. The participants are predetermined. There are people who are running the scenes behind the show. I was saying politics is the exact same way. The elections are the exact same way because it's all manipulated by people who are much more powerful than you or I. And I would also like to go to a page in the book that is 99 and to read something from Todd Wood and Walter Bosley's book. In the 1890s, Ingersoll Lockwood and his associates the co saw the coming century was a bright future of advancing technology which would retain the elegance of its visionaries' tastes. What we got instead was a century of socio-political nightmares, president warfare orchestrated by military-industrial agents of passive totalitarianism and an increasingly ugly aesthetic. For every good accomplishment like medical advancement, civil rights success, and space travel, there has also been big pharma assassinations and terrorism. Why did this happen? What will happen to this new century? With their tactics and manipulations, they stole the promise of a future past. With these, they intend to steal the promise of the future again. We suspect the answers may be found in pursuing other questions that remain. Well, let's, um, let's try to answer this question. Why did this happen in the 20th century? And... This was heavily, heavily seen years before, and there are all types of people, like theorists, I mean, even Otto von Bismarck talked about this, but there was also a Czech theorist named Ivan Bloch who thought about, no, sorry, not, I was thinking of Tomáš Masaryk, Tomáš Masaryk was the uh, Czech theorist, he did something else, Ivan Bloch was, um, different guy, and he was talking all about the industrialization of nations. No, he wasn't from Czechoslovakia, excuse me. Ivan Bloch thought that the overwhelming power of military technology would surpass humanity, 
Maybe when you were in elementary school, you heard your teacher say something like, we have enough nuclear warheads to blow up the world three times. Well, that's what he was talking about, and even if that's not an exact number, and that's just somebody saying a remark off the cuff, that's what he was talking about, that military technology would become so powerful that humanity would not be able to survive. Maybe you've seen a movie called The Matrix or something and seen what technology can do. Maybe you've heard of Terminator and the rise of the machines. That's also um, some very similar things that people are predicting will happen. But what about the 20th century, right? Well, what happened? World War One, And there were all of these new advancements in technology. The air war and chemical warfare entered into a new, more powerful dimension. And the reason why World War One truly changed modern culture is because there was less of a desire to be connected to the elites. And people really recognize that the global elites can kill us for their own selfishness and ignorance. And why did World War I happen? Maybe Is it because some guy named Gavrilo Princip shot Franz Ferdinand the Archduke and that started World War I? No, absolutely not. Wars are not started simply because of something like that. What really happened was there was an entangled set of alliances between the power structures of the earth and all the different countries are on this side or that side, and it turned into a powder keg. But it's because of the bad decisions that were made by political leaders, and people were very much aware of that. Steve Martin wrote a stage play called Picasso at the La Panna Gilles, which talks about that very concept in the 20th century. And in his own writing, his interpretation of this, he says that the 20th century was the first time when the accomplishments of artists and thinkers outweighed those of politicians and the military. Meaning that we had all sorts of developments happening in the 20th century, particularly film, media. I mean, think about what it's done for the distribution of the news. We're not only with newspapers, but we also had broadcast media and television, as well as even to the later parts of the 20th century with the internet. So absolutely, absolutely, the accomplishments of artists and thinkers have become more powerful. But so much of this is because there's this disdain and there's this rejection and there is this very sour feeling toward po politicians and thinkers and people who start wars because of entangled alliances, people who start wars not because they're trying to defend any noble cause, it's simply because people are out of control. Our leaders were either out of control or they made some really bad decisions. And I kid thee not, I mean, people were predicting this, the um, the Great War well in advance. And what's that um, Igor Stravinsky in The Rites of Spring even shows um, this in musical form, like in the, in, in the creation of a ballet about how people are very much aware about how divided factions and then this side versus that side can lead to destruction. But those are some of my own original responses to the questions in the book. I would also like to go to something that is written here on page 69 that says, We come to the part of this examination in which Ingersoll Lockwood is perhaps most relevant to our times. His work of political fiction titled 1900 or the Last President, published in 1896 by the American News Company of New York, 1900 TLP, is a rather dull read. Only in its resonant points with our political situation of late in the United States does it stimulate. Essentially, it is the story of civil unrest being spun up by one presidential election featured in the story. It is in certain details where Lockwood distinguishes himself as a prescient vision even more starkly, suggesting that our present times may have a long-lasting impact on the future of the nation. The best way to approach this material is by chapter and identify the pertinent details of them in context to the book. The book opens with a quote, The Chicago platform assumes, in fact, the form of a revolutionary propaganda machine. It embodies a menace of national disintegration and destruction. Right from the first page do we have resonance with our times for this story and puts Chicago factions against a New York establishment. More specifically, consider first what the quote says about Chicago. It represents a menace of national disintegration and destruction. The Chicago platform is all about revolutionary propaganda. 
who is associated with Chicago. And then, I kid thee not, Democrats, specifically former President Barack Obama, who is an organizer in Chicago. Now, on the one hand, I completely understand what they're trying to do here, and they're drawing parallels with the past and the future. I am all for how history repeats itself and looking at the ways in which the same political cycle has been used over and over again, time and time again. Now, is there actually some type of prescient knowledge, as um, they uh, talk about in this book? Um, oh, but fun fact, that word actually has four acceptable pronunciations, prescient, 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 and prescient, and um, yeah, anyway, but about, um, are they actually predicting the rise of Obama? No, I don't think so. Instead, I think that there's something so much more valuable. History repeats itself. We have this political faction versus that political faction. And they also talk about William Howard Taft in this book as well. And the thing that I noticed, again, my own original observation, was that from the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant all the way to... William Howard Taft. There was only one president who was not from either New York or Ohio, and that was Benjamin Harrison from Indiana. And the reason why is because they needed New York and Ohio to carry the elections, to have lots of electoral votes, and there are lots of presidents from New York and Ohio in our presidential history, but yes, from Grant to Taft, there's only been one president from, the, uh, from a different state, and that was Benjamin Harrison. So, there are reasons why these things happen, but back in 2019, I was authoring a paper for um, a university, and it was all about how the big government, small government debate, that's been going on since the 1700s, not the 1800s, the 1700s, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, and even before the turn of the 19th century. I mean, they're talking about these things in the founding documents of our country about some of the exact same issues that we have today. Yes, we've had differences in military technology, and we've had differences in some of the political and cultural movements of the time, but in the same bare-bones elements, you can identify very, very similar patterns of, of operation but what I would be much more curious is investigating the concept of secret knowledge. Because one thing that I've always told you guys on this channel is oligarchy is real. I mean, of course, aristocracy is real. Nobody ever doubted that. But oligarchy is real because that's more difficult to hide. Oligarchy is not done by bloodline. There are concentrations of wealth and concentrations of power only for the few. And the New World Order is also real. The New World Order is just the mechanism which allows oligarchy to propagate. And when you actually listen to conspiracy theorists who are talking about there's some type of secret knowledge going on, you'd be like, that's just a crazy conspiracy theory. No, it's not. Oh, no. For the following reason. Have you heard of corruption? Well, what do you think that is? That's the secret knowledge that they're talking about, and they're, they're abusing their power in a way that is corrupt. I mean, that's all of these things. They're just being very flamboyant and boisterous, and they're using a lot of far-out language to get your attention. The New World Order, the globalists, the tyrants, and the social engineers. Yeah, there's corruption. Yeah, people are hoarding wealth, and they're using their wealth to obtain power, or sometimes people use their power to obtain wealth. Both of those things happen. All of that stuff is real. Now, is there actually some type of guarding of a secret bloodline for the purposes of oligarchy? And, well, that would mean oligarchy and aristocracy at the same time. I mean, that I'm not sure of, but I'm definitely curious about it. And I've always said if someone has proposed an idea, I will talk about it. I think there's a big difference between the actual ability to see the future and the ability to think that there is a group of people working in the shadows. And the first is, to see the future, you would need some type of psychic ability. You would need some type of connection between the human brain and mind, 
and the ability to interact with events that haven't happened yet, meaning that there's some type of energy or power that is coming from the brain and going to these events, whatever they are. And I don't believe that we've documented that under controlled conditions. But if you just want to say that, yeah, there are corrupt people in our country and corruption has been going on for generations, no matter what your political stance is, no matter what your ideology is, there is there are corrupt people and it's been going on for generations. Well, yes. Now, are the people actually protecting some type of sacred bloodline that's been going on since at least the Illuminati in the 1800s? Again, I don't have documentation of that, but I will definitely investigate that one. Because unlike psychic powers, I mean, I can actually look for clues in literature and uh, stuff like this here with Ingersoll Lockwood. And I do give great praise to Todd, Bos Todd Wood and Walter Bosley for... Um, exploring something, for exploring something and asking questions and just trying to challenge the mainstream and to look for something in a different place, you know, taking the path less traveled by. But what do you think about all of this? And what do you think about any of my own observations? And I know I said I was going to jump all over the map, but I do give them also credit for this um, illustration by Johnson bears an amazingly striking resemblance to Baron Trump. But another important um, distinction is that Baron Trump spells his name B-A-R-R-O-N, that's the son of Donald Trump, and the fictional Baron Trump of the 1893 novel spells his name B-A-R-O-N, there's only one R as opposed to two, but at one more time, his uh, book is called Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey, and the other one is 1900 or The Last President, and when I was messing around on Google earlier, I actually saw that they were available at Walmart for purchase, I mean walmart.com. And, of course, this book is The Mystery of Ingersoll Lockwood by Todd Wood and Walter Bosley, and you can look out for that one online. It is from Corvus Publishing. All right, thank you so much for listening to this episode, and I know that it's some different material for this channel, but I wanted to uh, talk about it for a couple different reasons. Firstly, to uh, give thanks to Todd Wood for providing me with a copy of it, but also to... Just my own observations, as I said, about the East and the West and the Sun and the Moon, as well as the 20th century and the um, rise of writers and thinkers. And another interesting fact about the 20th century is there was a very strong push toward the Cubist art movement in the early part of the 20th century, Cubism, because not only photography, but also the moving pictures, movies, were becoming more popular, and what artists had to do was they had to do things that the filmmakers could not, and that led to um, a very big rise of cubism, and then we have surrealism, and I mean surrealism can even get into some very dangerous stuff in the 20th century where um, maybe you would get stuff like the Black Dahlia murder where somebody like George Hill Hodel was trying to create a surrealist form of art emulating the artist Man Ray. So he murdered Elizabeth Short in the name of surrealism. But again, George Hill Hodel was never convicted of the Black Dahlia murder, but he is a suspect. So there are a lot of ways in which art can evolve, and that definitely happened a lot during um, these uh, time periods from 1900 all the way to 1950, the early parts of the 20th century. So once again, thank you to everybody for listening to this. I wanted to share a lot of my own observations, and if you want to challenge me on anything, put your ideas in the comment section down below. And you can also respond to the three possibilities in this book. How did this uh, individual foresee the rise of Baron Trump living in Trump Castle, which is extraordinarily similar to Trump Tower? I don't dispute that either. And talking about the last president... Same guy wrote both books. What really is going on there? Is it coincidence? Does he actually have the ability to see the future? Or is he exposing some type of secret knowledge that the global elites are using and they're protecting? And the final thing is, maybe you've heard of this guy named Alex Jones out there, if he's still around. And his worldview was more about how there is this cabal of individuals who are running the show who are running the political theater, who are operating behind the scenes controlling events, and some people call them the globalists. 
sometimes, you know, just simply calling them the New World Order or talking about how they're trying to destroy humanity. But when you actually look at what those claims are, it is that there are concentrations of wealth, there are concentrations of power. And the way that you can actually have power over people is to, well, control them, right? Power, control. That's not a ridiculous thing. Well, how do you get control over people? You manipulate their consumer choices, product placement, advertising. And even Alex Jones talked about this clear as day, like back when he was on YouTube anyway, and I actually listened to him. I, I didn't listen to Alex Jones once since he got deplatformed. And it's all about the, um, like, he talks so much about Edward Bernays and public relations and how public thought is manipulated through, well, just that. It's through the media, through advertising, newspapers, and um, they're just putting out ideas to get people to think in a certain way to make certain consumer choices. So these concentrations of wealth and power become fortified, and the people who don't have the wealth and power are expendable. But the way you control them isn't to have some type of nuclear holocaust where you're just going to be dropping bombs all over the world and killing a bunch of people. No, it's so much more beneficial to profit from people, enslaving them in a way in which they are simply just buying things and they are spending their money on things that are going to make them sick, like, I mean, fast food cigarettes, I mean, drugs, even maybe you've heard something about the fentanyl crisis. So then they need to purchase um, very expensive medical care. And if they don't pay for the medical care, then they'll pay for it with the taxes like the other systems do. So then no matter what, you're, the global elites are getting all of their money, and the poor are going to stay poor, the rich are going to stay rich, and certain rich people, again, only a certain group of people, are going to have access to the... Um, well, the concentration of wealth and the concentration of power, aristocracy plus oligarchy. Oligarchy is very real. I'm a little bit skeptical about this whole sacred bloodline issue that's going on, about how only certain people can be incorporated into this because of their bloodline. But, I mean, I would love to read your responses in the comments section down below. And what do you think about any of this? I do not really think that it's too controversial to say that people are trying to sell addictive substances. I mean, caffeine, like coffee, alcohol, tobacco, and now the um, the fentanyl, opioids, though that there's just an epidemic of that type of behavior, hit my home state of West Virginia very hard. That stuff is real, and there is a secret knowledge of that, because some people know exactly what's going on. I mean, they just did this um, just show uh, Dope Sick out on Hulu. I watched the first episode, was so uh depressing i didn't continue with that but everyone's been telling me to go back and watch more of it so what do you think about any of this you can put your ideas in the comment section down below i would love to read your stuff and i'll see you over on instagram for the bonus podcast until next time